Warning, your money in the bank is at extreme risk. Did you know the money in the bank is not your money? Legally, it's not yours. It's only owed to you. This was evidence for the entire world to see over the last few weeks as Canada moved to literally freeze and still accounts all across Canada. But it's not only Canadians that should be worried. If you keep your money in the bank, you need to beware of the extreme dangers. So in this video, I'm going to break down the history of fiat currencies, why the financial system today is going to cause governments around the world to move onto your savings accounts, the history of this happening, what banks are doing to make it easy for themselves to take your money, why the FDIC might not be as safe as you think, and how governments use emergency powers, and of course, what you should be doing to protect yourself and keep your money. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you are new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss, and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything you have learned is wrong. And if you don't understand this the right way, it could be drastic for you. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into this. We are talking about how safe is your money? Extreme danger. That's right, your money is extreme danger. Uh, real quick, I'm not gonna dive super deep into this. If you watch this channel, you already know the history of fiat currency. Fiat currency is, of course, the government money. Um, just so you know, every fiat currency has failed. That's right, every currency has failed. We can look back, this chart is so big, you can't actually see it that good, uh, but you can see that these fiat currencies have a long history of not lasting very long. The reason why this is relevant to understand is because as they start failing, you can count on your government to start doing some very shady things that you should be aware of. So you need to understand that first of all, and then you need to understand where we are in that cycle. So the two best fiat currencies so far, as you might have guessed, is of course the US dollar and the, and the British pound. We can see that over the course of time, the purchasing power, so it's not that things get more expensive or get more valuable, it's that the dollars, the fiat currencies lose value, so it takes more of them to buy the same things. And so you can see the purchasing power has basically fallen off a cliff and has been basically flatlined. So what that means is that from uh, in the last like 200 years, the pound sterling has basically lost 99% of its purchasing power, which of course doesn't sound very good, and that's because it's not. Lost over 99% of its purchasing power. If you want to see an illustration of what do I mean by that purchasing power, here's a good illustration. So uh, here we have in 1928, $20 would have bought you an overflowing basket of goods. This is how CPI is supposed to work. They measure a basket of goods and then over time they measure how much that same basket of goods gone up. Here in 1996, 20 bucks would have still got you a pretty full basket of goods. Here we are 2017 and maybe you get a couple of goods and of course today in 2021 maybe you get a couple of items. I remember not that long ago I used to go to lunch for five bucks for a sandwich, chips, and a drink. The other day I paid 20 bucks, actually it was almost 25 dollars for a sandwich and chips and a drink. From five to 25 it's amazing. All right so the reason why it's unimportant to understand that is because when those currencies start failing when they're at their end, it's time to reset the system. I've used this example a bunch. If we were playing a game and we we're out of moves, what do you do? You have to reset the game. And that's exactly what we're talking about. It's a high signal. So when you see the currencies failing, this is why it's important for us to understand, when it starts failing, that's the signal for us that this crisis will be coming soon. Now I've used this chart many times before, so you've seen this. Uh, this just signifies how much debt the governments of the around the world have. Of course, it's illustrated in this color. You can see it's a massive amount of debt. And what's important to understand here is the debt to GDP ratios. So you can see here in this chart, the debt to GDP of most of the nations is extremely high. Here we have Japan trying to uh, beat the world. They're doing their best at it. The United States was up about 135%. They've come down a little bit recently. But what's important to understand about this debt to GDP ratio is per the Keynesian multiplier, once a nation gets over 90% debt to GDP, the amount of debt they take on doesn't give them the growth they need. That's a big problem and so it starts just sinking them deeper into the hole. And as a matter of fact, we have reports that 51 of 52 countries, so pretty much all of them, 51 out of 52 countries, once they've reached 130% debt to GDP, it ends in failure. 
51 out of 52 times it's ended in failure. And of course, as I said, the United States got over that 130% uh, threshold. It's important to understand because remember, that's the signal for the crisis. Now we can look back through time, 1944. We have these, uh, in 1944, you might have heard me talk about this over and over and over again, was the Bretton Woods Agreement. That's when the entire financial system was reset. So about every 80 years, this long-term debt cycle plays out. About every 80 years, the financial system resets, the financial revolution. I've talked about this in my three revolution cycles. Editor Wood and put the financial revolution cycle up here for them to watch. But in the Bretton Woods Agreement, the entire global financial system was reset onto a global one monetary system. Of course, that was the gold system. The dollar was pegged to gold, all the other currencies were pegged to the dollar. Now, that was 1944, 80 years later, right now, 130% debt to GDP, central banks are out of moves. What do you do when you're out of moves? You reset it. Bretton Woods was a reset of the financial system, a new global monetary system. Today, we have the IMF calling for another one. As a matter of fact, they're calling for a Bretton Woods 2 moment. You can see right here, a new Bretton Woods moment, Kristalina Georgieva from the IMF is calling for that. So we need to be aware of that because this is the signal of when things are starting to get pretty bad. Now, if we look back, there's a history of economic theft. What do I mean by that? Well, that means uh, governments and banks stealing your money, stealing your wealth. It happens a lot. So there's the high debt levels, 130% debt to GDP, precedes the seizure. So when you see that we're reaching these debt levels, when you see that we're approaching a reset, when you see that they're calling for a reset, then you can be sure that the seizure comes after that. A couple examples of that. We can go back to 1933. Most of you probably are aware of this, Act 6102. May 1st, 1933, what happens? The banks go on, quote, a bank holiday. <laughs> that means the bankers go on holiday, the banks are closed, and you can't get your money out. Not a holiday for you. <laughs> They're on a holiday, your money is locked in the bank. What happens? The banks shut down for about a week. When they open back up, you don't get your money. So at the time, before 1933, gold was money. Gold was money for 5,000 years. We put our gold in the banks. We had paper gold certificates. 20 of these paper gold tickets, 20 of these dollars equaled an ounce of gold. The banks go on holiday. When they open back up in 1933, I can no longer get my gold. And as a matter of fact, instead of $20, 20 paper certificates for an ounce of gold, now it's 35 paper gold certificates for an ounce of gold, which means not only did they steal all your money, they also devalued it, so you lost another 60%. Super, super cool, right? Sounds fun. Well, in 2013, this isn't just old history. I know, 80, 90 years ago. Uh, this isn't just ancient history. In 2013, the same thing happened in Cyprus. We saw in Cyprus, the same thing played out. We saw massive amounts of debt accumulate. So you could see this proceeding. You knew there was gonna be a problem right here if you were paying attention. And sure enough, after that debt level built up, here we see depositors lose 47% of savings in the bailout. So when Cyprus got this high level of debt, guess what they did? They took the money from the people, 47%. Now, I know this is more recent, but could it happen? Does it happen in bigger countries? Cyprus is kind of a small country. Well, we saw the same thing in Greece here. Even more recently, we saw the public debt as a percentage shot through the roof. And then of course, like I said, it proceeds. So what happens next? Well, Greece will close banks for six days. Oh, sounds familiar, right? The old banker's holiday. Six days and impose limits on withdrawal. So the bankers go on holiday, but you can't get your money. So you don't go on a holiday, but that's what happens. Now, again, this is not just ancient history. Here we have in 2021, Lebanon, of course, what happens? Lebanese banks start building up massive amounts of debt. This is the signal, uh-oh, something's about to happen, right? Well, let's see what happened after that. Well, as you might imagine, Lebanese cannot access the money in the banks. <laughs> Rack up high levels of debt, freeze your funds in the bank. Are you starting to see how this works? It happened in the United States, it happened in Cyprus, it happened in Greece, it happened in Lebanon, but here's what's even worse about this. Just like 6102 in the United States in 1933, the government stole your gold and gave you back fake 
worthless paper gold certificates. They took one thing and gave you something different. Pay attention to that piece. Lebanon, the same thing. Lebanon plan sees 93% currency slide. What does that mean? You just lost 93% of your purchasing power. Your $100 now buys you $7 worth of goods. But here's what they did. They took the money that they had in the bank and they, de uh, and they deposit and they converted it to pounds. So you had one type of money in the bank and they gave you something different, just like the United States did. They took your real physical gold, real money, and gave you fake worthless pieces of paper, just like Lebanon did as well. That's a very key point. All right, so part of the way the banks do this is it's called a bail-in. They're broke, <laughs> they need a bailout, but instead of a bailout, they do a bail-in. That means they just take your money. It's much easier that way. You've already got the money there, right? So we see that all around the world. We're seeing banks are actually starting to change their bail-in laws. They're actually starting to change that. Why would they do that? Uh, have they been keeping you up on that? Maybe it's so they can get your money easier. Here we saw in Australia back in 2013, I'm sorry, 2018, Australia started to change their bank bail-in laws. If you're in Australia, you should probably know about that. Of course, you know, your bank didn't send you out a notice and tell you that. It's up to you to figure that out. In the EU, the, the EU banks agree to a bail-in deal here. And so again, they change the rules so they can take your money. Now, what you may not know is that when you go open up a bank account, you have a whole packet of information. And of course, it's so big and so thick, you can't read it all. So you just sign, 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 sign. In that paperwork, what you're saying is that I am giving you my money and I understand that it's no longer my money. I understand I'm giving it to you and then now it's your money and now it's an IOU. You're, you owe me the money. All right, that has massive uh, implications legally. All right, now, like I said, it happened in Australia, it happened in Europe. The FDIC, so you might be saying, Mark, but in the United States, we have the FDIC. So that means if the bank were to go under, the FDIC gives me money. Okay, well, let's talk about that because the FDIC may not be what you think. What do I mean by that? Well, if we look at the FDIC um, per uh, Investopedia's definition of that, we can see that the FDIC was uh, put together by the government to bail the banks out, right? So if the bank were to go under, don't worry, your money's insured, we'll step up and give you that money back. However, what will they give you back? Remember that money legally is not your money, all right? So they owe you money and maybe they can give you something different. Now, first of all, if they, if they have to go print, several trillion dollars to pay everybody back, that dilutes everything. So at best, you get, if you had a thousand dollars in the bank, you get a thousand dollars back, but now those thousand dollars buy you $500 worth of goods at best. Or maybe instead of getting the thousand back, you only get 500 back and it only buys $250 worth of goods. Or maybe they give you back something completely different, just like what happened in the United States in 1933, just like what happened in Lebanon. All right, this has happened in the US and it happens in other countries recently. So maybe what they do is they say, well, um, we can't give you back the dollars anymore. Maybe now you get our new central bank digital currency. Hmm, that could be interesting. You know, of course, emergencies, the whole world's in an emergency right now. The United States is still in an emergency, even though the pandemic's over, but they believe that these emergencies suspend their laws and they can do all kinds of things. Now we know that all central banks, this is fact, it's not opinion, all central banks are rushing to get their central bank digital currencies out. We can see that the yellow are where central bank digital currencies are already being issued. Of course, they're already being out in China. They rolled them out at the Olympics just recently. They've been testing them for a couple of years. Uh, through the Bahamas, um, there's central bank digital currencies being used. Um, the United States has, has, uh, has already been working on it for about a year and a half. They just submitted it for, um, for comments. So they're rapidly approaching the use of it. The EU is working on central bank digital currencies. This is a fact. It's only a matter of when they come out. And of course, it's my speculation that maybe there's some sort of a bait and switch there. But again, like I said, we have these emergency powers. And that's what we have to be careful of. We can see how they've used the premise of war 
in order to use these emergencies. Of course, what's more an emergency than war? Of course, there's all types of wars. The military really needs to be prepared for three wars. There's a kinetic war, that's shooting war, uh, a cyber war, and also a bioterrorism war. Those are all wars. So we can see, of course, we've been in the war for the last two years. Trump labels himself a wartime president. A wartime, he was uh, <laughs> combating a uh, I'm not going to say the word, the cerveza sickness, as my buddy George Gammon calls it, um, a wartime president. Here we have uh, Biden um, calling for a wartime, or the, the Fed's calling for a wartime economic thinking, right? They're talking about wars. We can see here that uh, the cerveza sickness in the Constitution, governments struggle to balance collective safety with personal autonomy. So under this emergency, maybe your freedom should be suspended, right? It's the war that hides these ballots. The pandemic is called a war. You can see that. And if, if we have a war, it can hide these ballots. It can hide, I should say, the bail ins. And of course, now we actually have moved on to another form of war, which of course I'm sure you're aware of. We'll get to that in a second. Now, um, the last several weeks, the entire world has been watching what's going on in Canada. Now, if you thought your money was safe in the bank and you've been watching what happened in Canada for the last couple of weeks, I'm sure it's got you rethinking that right about now. Of course, good old Justin Trudeau he invoked these emergency powers. Uh, the emergency was that there was people waving flags and singing the national anthem. It was super dangerous. Uh, they didn't have weapons. They weren't uh, burning down buildings like we saw happen all across the United States during the last presidential election cycle. Uh, instead, they were just singing songs and dancing and had bouncy houses. Looked pretty, look, look pretty threatening, but he used that as an opportunity to put emergency powers into place and then use that to justify extreme laws. Canadian protesters, truck seized, bank accounts frozen over connection. So even being connected allowed the banks to steal your money. Using the threat of war or the emergency to steal your money. And of course, when do they do that? They do that when their debt levels are extremely high. Here we see Trudeau claimed emergency powers were temporary. Of course, there's nothing as permanent as a temporary government measure. Um, but, you know, everybody thinks of Canada as this democracy, freedom-loving people. But if we can see here, if we compare India versus Canada, of course, most people think Canada is free, India is not as free. We can see that there's a, quite a difference right here. So when protests happened in India, they had 11 rounds of talks with the protesters. In Canada, Justin Trudeau refused to even meet with them. All they said was, hey, all we want is the mandates dropped. Most of the provinces around Canada had already dropped them, but Trudeau wouldn't even come talk to them. Um, in in uh, India, no arrests were made for blocking roads. Of course, in Canada, they froze all the bank accounts of the protesters. Uh, they took the matter to the court. In India, they went to the courts to see um, what, what they should do. But of course, in Canada, they imposed national emergency so they could bypass all the courts. Um, and so in the democracy ranks, India's 53. They're a very flawed democracy, supposedly, while Canada is a full democracy at five. But of course, we can see how they work has been completely different. Um, I have these charts. I'm not going to run through all these, but we can see um, all the banks. This is uh, Scotia Bank. This is uh, RBC. This is the amount of outages that they had. So what happened is when they tell you that you don't have the right to keep your money in the bank as yours, or that we're probably going to freeze or seize your money, guess what happens? people go and get their money out of the bank, right? Makes sense. And so we can see massive outages through all the banks. That's TBD, here's CIBC. And even good old Jordan Peterson had a strong message that he's been told. Um, let's go ahead and play this video from Jordan Peterson. You know, I don't know what to make of all of this because it's happening so quickly. I can't believe the state to which the country has degenerated. I've been in contact with a reliable source within the Canadian military, and he told me today by email that if I had any sense, I'd take my money out of the Canadian banks because the situation is far worse than I've been informed. And so that's just one of many such messages I receive on a daily basis. So let's talk about the banks. So here's what our prime minister did last week. He permanently destroyed 20% of the population's faith in the entire Canadian banking system and stained the Canadian banking system's international reputation, I would say, for decades. Now, if all of that isn't bad enough now, how we have an entire new war, conflict, emergency, 
whatever, whatever word you want to use, in Russia and Ukraine. Of course, I made a video uh, over four weeks ago where I predicted that Russia would, in fact, invade Ukraine and the U.S. would, in fact, do nothing about it. Um, I'm not going to dig super deep into that. You can go back and watch that video. We'll go ahead and link that video right here uh, talking about World War III. However, we saw that Russia did move on Ukraine. As a matter of fact, it was an entire shock and awe. They literally came and bombed the entire country to take it over. But this poses massive risks for your money as well. Okay, what kind, of what kind of risks are we talking about? Well, the U.S. and, the, and Europe are threatening. Now we see Russia invades Ukraine. Here we go. Um, and then what, what's the response in the U.S. and the West of Europe? Biden to impose additional sanctions on Russia now that Ukraine assault is underway. So what are sanctions? Well, they block the flow of money. You could be caught up in that. And it's not just being caught up in that, but here we can see that Russia says that they may seize retail deposits if sanctions go too far. So now Russia is saying they might do their own bail-in, because it's an emergency, if sanctions, so they've gone to war, the U.S. and Russia threat, uh, U.S. and Europe threaten sanctions, and Russia says if sanctions go too far, they will seize your money. Pretty interesting, and so you don't want to be caught in the crosshairs of that. Um, like I said, I did a recent video about that. You can find it on the channel. Uh, um, I talked about a cyber attack, a cyber pandemic. So Russia says that if they get sanctions, if anybody interferes, they will meet it with a swift and asymmetric response. Of course, uh, the media tells us that Russia is the main leader in cyber warfare. So uh, Russia said it would be something we haven't seen before. It doesn't take a lot of imagination. That would probably be a cyber attack, which of course, as they've gamed this out, the cyber attack would most likely be done on financial targets. Go back and watch this video right here if you want to get caught up on that. As you can see, there is danger all around in the financial system. So how do you protect yourself? All right, this is getting crazy. How are you going to protect yourself? Well, the first thing is you want to be able to hold, in, hold some assets outside the bank. So in 1933, in, the, in, in Greece, when they go on a bank holiday, <laughs> they're on holiday, which means you can't get your money. Your debit card doesn't work, the ATMs don't work, and so you want to have some money outside of the bank. Um, it used to say, we used to say about investments, only invest what you can afford to lose. Now I would say only keep the money in the bank that you can afford to lose. Kind of, quite, quite a turn of events. Um, you want to be holding real assets. Um, real assets, of course, are things that are real, so commodities, real estate, things that can't be artificially inflated. Uh, gold is doing extremely well. Gold is a chaos hedge, so at a time like this, when the whole world is full of chaos, gold is starting to shine finally after kind of a year of going down. Of course, you know that I uh, love Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a way that we can hold our money outside of the system. We can move it around easily. Gold isn't as easy to move around. Of course, we say not your keys, not your coins. So we want to be holding that Bitcoin in our own custody, not on an exchange. It's the same as keeping it in a bank. If you have gold, don't hold it in an ETF. Keep some gold at your house or in a safe, uh, a safe deposit box that you can control with your Bitcoin. Keep custody of that. Keep your keys as well. Like I said, that is the key component. Those are the ways that I'm going to be protecting myself. Of course, there's way more when it comes to navigating around this that you need to be aware of. And so it's so important that I'm actually going to have a live event coming up. Uh, very, very shortly, there's a link down below. I have about 15 of the top speakers in the world on these exact subjects, how to build, grow, and protect your wealth. Come check out the live event. They're going to tell you what is going to happen over the next couple of years, what you should be doing to protect your money, to build, grow, and protect it. Uh, there's a link down below. I'd love to see you there. Uh, but let me know what you think. How do you plan to protect yourself as the governments around the world move to take your money in the bank? I'd love to hear it. Leave a comment down below. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. And if you don't like the video, that's okay. Give me a thumbs down. But at least tell me why. Leave me a comment down below. All right, that's what I got for you today. To your success, I'm out.